May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, the one who gives us strength and the one who does redeem us. Amen. Amen. The well-known and widely respected Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann said this about Psalm 23. It's almost pretentious to comment on this psalm. It's such a simple statement that it can bear its own witness without comment. I'm done. <laughs> I was really tempted. It would have made for a very easy week not to have to prepare a sermon. You've heard Psalm 23 so much in your lifetime, and particularly in funerals for a very good reason. You know it maybe as well as the Lord's Prayer. At the 8 o'clock service this morning when we prayed Psalm 23, roughly half the crowd prayed it without looking at it. It comes to our lips quite easily. We heard another variation of this, one of my favorite hymns, hymn 645, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, a beautiful hymn using the words from Psalm 23. Brueggemann said that this psalm reminds us that it's God's companionship that transforms situations. It doesn't mean that there's no death valley, it doesn't mean you don't have enemies, but in the end, in God's end, and in your end, they are not capable of hurt. Psalm 23 knows that evil is very present in this world, and we know that, but it is not to be feared, for confidence in God is the source of life and joy. I intentionally ask our lectors, when they introduce a psalm, to invite that we pray the psalm together, rather than let us recite the psalm, because the psalms are not the Declaration of Independence. We don't recite the psalm. We pray them because it's the most ancient prayer book we have. It's the ancient prayer book of the Hebrew people. And so these are prayers. And some of these prayers express a lot of raw emotions, which is what I hope you do when you pray. I talk to, of course, no big surprise in my line of work, I talk to people almost every day about praying. People ask me, how do I pray? How much should I pray? What should I pray for? What should I not pray for? And I often hear people and I've been guilty of this, who want to figure out some magic string of words to put together. As if I, if I can get the right words strung together, then God is going to hear me more or do something more than he would at other times. The Psalms that most gut level place we pray. Do you recall Psalm 22? We all know Psalm 23. Do you remember Psalm 22? We may not because it's much longer and so we don't have it memorized. It begins this way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words if you recall that Jesus said as he died, Jesus actually prayed, God, why have you left me? Where in the heck are you? Jesus prayed that. Why are you so far from my cry? I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. 
I cry by night as well, but I find no rest. I suspect that if you are like me and like most other humans, there has been some time in your life, some moment, maybe it's because of a relationship, maybe it's the loss of a job, maybe someone has died, you have found yourself in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day asking that very thing, my God, why, why have you done this? Why? That's a good prayer. Don't be ashamed for praying that. I hear sometimes people apologize for prayers like that. No, don't. It's a very good prayer. It's a very honest one. For prayer is a conversation with our creator. It's a conversation with our maker. I've always been struck by the number of parents who have told me that the way they parent is they want their children to be able to come and tell them anything. They want to develop such a trust with their children that their children can come and tell them anything. That's the way it is with God. Tell God anything that's on your mind, any emotion you have. Whatever is in here should be the words on your lips if you speak to God, or maybe it's known deep, deep in the silence. So I'm always curious why people sort of clam up when it comes to expressing their emotions to God. Let it all out. God can take it. Sometimes we hear or say Psalm 23 so often that we may not really hear it. We may not really hear the words. And that's the way it is with a lot of things in life. We've heard things for so many years that we begin to believe certain things we hear. That's the way it was with the disciples. Maybe on a fishing boat as a kid growing up listening to their father, they heard certain things. And so one day they're walking with Jesus and they ask Jesus, what did this guy do? to be born blind. Was it his fault or his parents? Maybe the disciples heard that growing up, that if something bad happens to you, someone's at fault. Either you're responsible or blame heredity. The remarkable thing about this story is that Jesus not only does something for him, that's quite remarkable. His life is changed because of an encounter with Jesus. But the poor guy goes back to the temple to report it. And no one gives him a break. No one celebrates or is happy that his life is changed. He goes back to the temple. He goes to 10 o'clock Sunday morning church and he comes into St. Andrews and says, my life has been changed because of an encounter with Jesus. And often what we say in the church, particularly the Episcopal church, is, shh, keep, keep that down about Jesus. Don't we? At 8 o'clock, I had to give people permission to laugh. We who are Christians encounter Jesus of Nazareth. And in that encounter, he can change our life. That's what this guy reported. And the temple crowd told him to keep quiet, to move on down the road. Poor guy. In that world, in the first century, there was a very ancient way of thinking that if something bad, something evil had fallen you, you or someone was at fault. 
I dare suggest it's a modern way of thinking. I'm not sure we have really changed our thinking. We sometimes approach God or pray to God in a very transactional way. I hear this on television all the time. I hear this from usually men, men who have better teeth and better hair than I do, the televangelist, who will look into the camera and say that if you give more money, if you send me more money, then God will shower blessings on your life. It doesn't work that way. That's very ancient way of thinking about God. That if I do something, God is going to somehow make my life better or make me feel better. That's not a particularly good sermon to preach during stewardship. God is not going to improve your life by giving money to the church or to me. I know someone years ago who actually prayed that God would give her a parking space as she drove into downtown. I don't mean to belittle her. She is a wonderful, sweet, giving person, very faithful Christian. But she told me one day that she actually believed God would give her a parking space. God does not give a darn whether you get a parking space when you go into D.C. And God does not give a darn about the size of your bank account. What God is interested and concerned about is you. God is concerned and interested in you in having a conversation with you, one that is honest, one where you let all of your thoughts and emotions out, just like the psalmist. I'm struck that I have a lot of books on my shelf in my office on praying. I've been just as guilty over the years of going on retreats to learn how to pray better. And I go buy a book about how to pray. And the temptation is to read a book or go on a retreat when all God wants is for you to slow down, sit down, and talk to God. Instead of trying to figure out how to get the magic string of words put together, just be yourself. We are quite fond of Psalm 23. I've had some tell me this week around the office that the proper way to pray Psalm 23 is the King James Version. And so for those of you who are chuckling, you believe that, right? God hears you better in the Elizabethan tongue, right? It is such a simple statement that it can bear its own witness without comment. You, Walter Brueggemann is correct. Sometimes we need to hear Psalm 23 in a different way. So I'm going to invite you to hear Psalm 23 in a different way. I invite you, if you would like, to close your eyes. You don't have to, but if it helps you concentrate, I invite you to close your eyes. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. 
even when the way goes through Death Valley. I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. 